Hello, everybody. It's episode 110 of Recotopia. I'm Chris Atkinson. I'm joined by Aaron Dicer. Heidily ho, Cinerinos. And with, I am joined by Jeremy Scott. What's up, everybody? <clears throat> You're going to be hearing Scott a lot in this episode. Yes, you are. Scott Scott. Um, uh, yes, again, welcome, chat, who have come out here on a Tuesday. We actually mm -hmm. made it on the Tuesday, Aaron went off and watched an eclipse somewhere and we were yeah, worried did. about him. We were worried about him because not because of him being able to get back, but because of the apocalypse that would ensue. Mm -hmm. Um but uh does anybody have any small recommends? Me, me, I go, I go, please, Jeremy. <laughs> um so if you follow me on Twitter, uh, then you know that I recently, uh, on Friday and Saturday, I think it was Thursday or Friday, one of those two days, two of those, two of those three days, I uh, binged uh, the new Ripley uh, limited series on Netflix. This is based on the Talented Mr. Ripley book that the Talented Mr. Ripley movie from 1999 was based on. Was that 99? Yeah, 99. Oh. Yeah. Um, and also, if you know me at all, you know that I adore that movie. Um, so, of course, I was going to check this out. This is Steven Zalian, written and directed all eight episodes. If that name's mm. familiar to you, it's because he wrote a lot of great shit uh, like uh, Schindler's List and The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and oh, Moneyball, uh, The First Mission Impossible. Um, <clears throat> so he's... Uh, a man with a good resume, television-wise. Uh, his only other limited series, The Night of, another limited series that I mm. raved about. Mm -hmm. So this is Andrew Scott, who uh, is having a moment uh, and is probably going to be the next Cumberbatch, I think. Um, and I have not seen Fleabag. Um, the only thing I've seen him in that I really remember is uh, Catherine Called Birdie. Um, and he's great in that. Um, so he's playing Tom Ripley. This is the Matt Damon character. Um, and everything's in black and white. I say everything. There's a couple of shots that have some color, uh, like Schindler's List. Um, <clears throat> but this is shot in black and white. And one thing I read the other day that I think is very true is that you could pause any episode of this show at any moment, blow it up and have it framed and put it on the wall as fine art and it would work. Um, this is a gorgeous show to look at. Um, cinematography off the charts uh and andrew scott i think is undeniably mesmerizing in this role um <clears throat> the other the other thing i'm going to tell you to try and sell you on this without giving you too many details it does it does a lot of things differently than the movie a lot um <clears throat> but his first two murders are are similar in nature and location um as they are to the movie but this show <sighs> where the movie glosses over the aftermath of the murder and just kind of shows you Matt Damon's character being like, wow, that was weird. I murdered a guy. This show takes 20 minutes post murder with no dialogue to show Ripley scrambling to try and figure out, okay, that was, uh, that's done. Now, how the fuck do I deal with this body? How do I cover this up? Uh, and you see his mind working as he goes over each hurdle uh, I found it absolutely riveting. Those two particular episodes um, should win awards uh, out the wazoo. Um, <clears throat> other than that, um, I don't really want to say too much because if you know the book or the movie, I think this show will surprise you with a lot of the choices it makes. Mm. Um, I adored it. It's an 85, I think, on Rotten Tomatoes. So clearly not everyone's thing. Uh, I know Aaron has seen it, so I want to give him a sec to talk about it too. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I w th you're absolutely right about everything you said. Uh, it is exquisite, the visuals. The visuals just look amazing. Um, I am not necessarily one who sees black and white as better than, like, more artistic than color. So sometimes I get annoyed by stuff that's in black and white, and I can't find, like, a metaphorical reason or a storytelling reason. So there was a little bit of that for me, but it's so beautiful to look at. Um, Andrew Scott is amazing. Uh, he's incredible in it. And the murders are, for me, those are the reasons to go, or those two murders. They're very much from the, um, uh, what was it? Torn Curtain was the movie mm. where Hitchcock did this. There's a murder in Torn Curtain that is like this, where it's like Hitchcock set out to show murder isn't easy. 
It's not like it always looks so easy in in movies, but you know, it's it's hard to kill somebody sometimes. And um and so yeah, it lives in those murders in a way that feels very authentic and very human and uh yeah, those two scenes alone are worth the the price of admission. I didn't love it as much as you did, but I certainly appreciated it uh, all the way through. So, yeah. Cool. <clears throat> Absolutely. All right, Aaron, you got a smallie? I got I, – do I have a smallie? Uh, <laughs> mine's, mine's more of an innie uh, than an Audi. I don't know if it's smallie or biggie, uh, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with something that is very much me. And, look, somebody has to, has to you know, speak up. For those of us uh, who love trash television, and what I mean by trash television is easy just to kind of have on and watch. Uh, I started watching Deal or No Deal Island. Um, oh, now, no. what is inter- <gasps> what is interesting about this show that kind mm. that got me hooked was it is a combination of Deal or No Deal and Survivor. Now yes. you may go. How do you combine Deal or No Deal with Survivor? And that, my friends, is why you watch the show. Uh, it is, look, I watched Deal or, no De- uh, Deal or No Deal when it was on. I was uh, struck by the concept of odds and, you know, just the idea of how much do you have to give somebody to, you know, get them to walk away from what might be in their case. There's a lot of really interesting human decisions. But that show got old pretty quickly because it's just kind of the same kind of thing over and over this show adds in ideas of survivor like alliances and those kind of things so i'm going to try to explain a little bit how this works (laughs) basically there are tasks where they will go on that will add certain cases to each week's deal or no deal play. So like they'll try to find the $3.5 million case or the $2 million case. So they find these cases to add. And then the person who does the best at the challenge is immune from going home. The pe- the two people who do the worst at the challenge, one of them is going to play deal or no deal. Now the way that what happens then is they play deal or no deal. If they make a good deal, in other words, they take more money than's in their case, they get to send somebody home. They just get to pick somebody who leaves the game. If they make a bad deal in that what's in their case was actually more than what they ended up taking, they leave the game. And it adds this really interesting element of human psychology and and how you play. And then you add the fact that Boston Rob is on the first season, and I loved watching Boston Rob play Survivor, and he is having so much fun playing this game. I'm really digging it. I'm a reality show guy, competition reality show guy, so it doesn't shouldn't surprise you, but but I'm having a good time with Dealer No Deal Island. <laughs> and it is a recommend for me. I'm glad that you're putting up the good fight for that sweet old <laughs> underdog, the rea- the trash reality show. <laughs> Thank because you, it Chris. needs it. It <laughs> needs you. it. Oh my god, there's so there's so very few successes when it comes yes. down to there's it. There's like I like um, my fair share of trash reality shows, but this the mashup thing could either be, I mean it could either be the greatest thing ever or it could be awful, but I wonder if it's the beginning of a trend. I wonder if we're going to see more like naked and afraid, amazing race. <laughs> like, like, yeah. N- naked and amazing dude, race. Dude, I'm watching that show. I'm sorry. Why haven't they made that yet? They have actually made that show, by the way, in England. There is, I forget what it's called, but there is a show that is like Amazing Race where they have to find, they drop them off somewhere naked and they have to find their way home doing these challenges and different things and teams and they're oh, completely wow. naked and that's in England. But England has naked people on TV all the time. So That's very like, true. That's true. Know. It's funny. Yeah, and it, and and they're gonna have to find a way to put up these shows like you know on HBO, so it's like it's like naked and afraid, unblurred, you know that. Type <laughs> of um, um, uh, so I will I will continue uh, on the Andrew Scott love fest, and I swear to God, I watched this movie independently of Jeremy watching. <laughs> uh it is all of us strangers uh uh, came out last year i was unable to see this movie before our uh, year in review uh but uh this is this is a fascinating movie this is just Mm. a fascinating movie um i think it was sold as a gay drama that was you know kind of arty and moody or whatever but it's really a lot more than that um the uh the the basic premise is that andrew scott 
is a screenwriter that lives uh, in this apartment by himself. He's obviously like, you know, he's, he's in his forties. I don't know what they really consider what his age is in this, but he's, he's definitely like, you know, he's just, he's just living life and, and that, and not doing much. Uh, but one, one, uh, one day, um, someone knocks on his door. It's this, uh, uh, actor, uh, Paul Mescal, who, who you may have, uh, run into and in you're in, into some movies that you've seen re recently. I was shocked that Paul Mescal is 20 years younger than Andrew Scott. Oh, wow. Uh, He's, he was born in 1996 and I've seen Paul Mescal and a bunch of stuff where he's played fathers and stuff like this. And I'm like, man, I did not know there was that much of an age difference, but he shows up kind of drunk to, uh, Andrew Scott's apartment. And he, he's very bold and he's like, you know, can I, you know, Hey, I've seen you, I've seen you look at me. Would you like, would you like to, Hey, would you want to have me come in? You, know, you invite me in and Andrew Scott, uh, says no on the first night and then the movie gets super odd because andrew scott goes to visit his parents uh played by jamie bell and uh, claire foy but they're not wearing aging makeup or anything of that nature that makes it makes it uh makes you realize that hey that they're the they're older they're the age that he remembers them by basically mm. And he has conversations with them and it's almost like, and I, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not, and I'm sorry if this does count, if this counts as one, but it's almost like he's going back in time and he's explaining to his parents how life is now. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and he'll leave these, he'll leave these moments. And then, uh, he's, he sees Paul Mescal again. He wants to, he actually wants to see him this time. But Paul Mescal isn't interested the next time they see each other. But of course, eventually they get together and there is this beautiful relationship that starts and they are together for the, uh, for the most part. And we keep seeing Andrew Scott going back and visiting his parents and telling, telling them what's going on and everything. This movie is going in a direction. You don't quite realize where you don't, you, don't, you may think, you know, where this is going, but it's not, but you don't, you definitely don't. And, uh, the movie's very shocking to me and like, oh my God, it's a really, really, uh, amazing movie about grief and loss. And, uh, and you're going and Andrew Scott, man, talk about a guy who is looking, he, it feels like that guy is about to just break out finally. And everybody's going to know who he is, even though he's been in a million things at this point. Um, it feels like this guy is like laddering up to put potentially being like one of these perennially nominated Oscar guys. So, yeah. um, I would highly recommend this one. I agree. Uh, high recommend for me as well. Everything Chris said is, is dead on, especially the way this movie, uh, unfolds, I think is really, really brilliant. The way it gives you its information, uh, is, is really, really smart. Andrew Scott, like he came on my radar with Sherlock because he plays Moriarty mm -hmm. in in the BBC Sherlock. Speaking mm -hmm. of Benedict yep. Cumberbatch, uh, and he was incredible there. I was like, "Who is this guy?" And so I was paying attention since then. He's in one of my favorite episodes of Black Mirror. He has a Black Mirror episode yeah. uh, that he does that's that's really really good. And I just found out, I think I told you guys this in the email that he was one of the voices in Locke, one of our yep. favorite movies. He's mm. the, yep. the guy that's like, "Wait, you want me to run the mm. stuff there?" Because he was too drunk yeah. to drive it or whatever. Uh, uh, yeah, Scott, he's, he's so. got some of the best moments in lock. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, all of us strangers is great. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. On to our big recommend, which is sing <laughs> street, which I'm not sure I even introduced at the top, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, that is what our big recommend is. And it is, uh, it is Aaron's. So Aaron, take us away on sing street. All right, Sing Street, it's 2016 written, directed by John Carney. Uh, at that point he'd already given us once. Uh, and Begin Again, both of those had already come out. So by this point, we know we're about to get another lesson in the power of music. And boy, do we ever. It's Dublin in 1985. We start with a boy in his room strumming a guitar very poorly before he's called to a family meeting that starts with Littlefinger telling his family the money is tight, so they will be sending him to the Christian Brothers Education, whose motto is apparently act manly and boy, howdy, do they ever. 
He walks into school among hard looks from junior hires, fights in the parking lot, smoking in class, and some good old-fashioned forced face farting. He then finds out about the strict black shoe policy that Brother Baxter, who will be playing the part of the hard-nosed religious school authoritarian figure cliche for the movie. Uh, Later that day, he's held at Slingshot Point uh, until he does a jig for the local bully, Barry. It's then back to the family getting together to watch Top of the Pops and discuss how music videos are apparently better than the Beatles. The next day at school, uh, it goes even worse for Connor as he has to go shoeless because he didn't have his black shoes, still had the brown ones, and he's punched in the face by the same Barry the Bully. But this leads him to meet his new friend, Darren, who immediately made me very thankful that subtitles exist. Mm -hmm. Connor then meets a creepy girl who stands across from the school and stares at the students, uh, but he has an aha moment and wants her to... And huh. wants to take her on to do a video for his next, uh, for his non-existent band. So it is literally time to put the band together. We meet uh, Eamon, who plays every instrument in existence and has a dad who is in a cover band. He then parrots his older brother's Duran Duran thoughts from earlier in the movie and locks in Eamon, whose dad is at a place apparently for alcoholics who hit their wives and kids and apparently neighbors. Their next stop is to meet in gig after hearing about him through some casual racism from Darren and then Larry and Gary see the ad at school and join up since they seem to exist exactly to fit those parts of the band. Congratulations for finding Larry and Gary. They decide (laughs) to name the band Sing Street instead of the rabbits because Sing Street, of course, is the name of the movie. So it has to be that. <laughs> That's right. As, Emin, um, as Emin's mom has some personal time, they play Duran Duran's Rio. And whoa, wait a second. These guys can actually play. So we don't need a learning montage. Yay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Colin's brother then educates uh, Connor. Um, excuse me. Connor's brother then educates Connor on originality while remaining completely oblivious to the fact that he will burn to death in a bear suit someday. Uh, cut to they're writing their own music. The riddle of the model comes together pretty quickly. And so they set up a time to record with the voyeur girl that we met earlier. We cut to the video shoot and a conversation on fashion and who or is who or who isn't allowed to wear a cowboy outfit And wait, Are those storyboards? These kids did storyboards for their video in 1985. I love them. Uh, Mm -hmm. Larry the bully uh, comes by. I'm sorry. Barry the bully comes by and we get there's too many Aries. Barry, Gary, Larry. There's so many. Mm -hmm. Uh, Comes by and we get a visual representation of the truth that hurt people hurt people. The video shoot goes off without a hitch and we get the full version of the amazing riddle of the model. Connor then gives Rafina, who is the girl uh, from across the street, a bike ride home and takes his sweet time so he can woo her. But some older jerk face shows up in a convertible to take her away with his car and his stubble. Connor's brother imparts some more wisdom about Phil Collins. And then Connor heads over to Emmons' house to do some more writing. And the second song is somehow just as good as the first. It's so good that Connor immediately grows blonde hair out of the front of his head and develops an addiction to guy liner. <laughs> brother Baxter, however, doesn't dig it. So he invites his quote unquote pretty face to his personal bathroom. But when Connor decides uh, not to, he chases him to the main bathroom and forcefully cleans the makeup off in the sink. Meanwhile, Rafina has decided his name is Cosmo for some reason, and she wants him to write a happy song. It was also in this moment that I learned that brown bread is Cockney rhyming slang for having a dead father as a way to quickly do character exposition cliche. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Cosmo's older brother then tells him that The Cure are kind of a happy, sad band, and they listen a bit, and they are so good, Connor immediately grows poofy hair. They then record the video for the third song, and Rafina decides to go all method and jumps into the river, even though she can't swim because it's art, and it has to be authentic. So she uh, gets saved as Connor jumps in after her, and he goes in for a kiss, but then ruins it by mentioning the older dude before he and Rafina stare into the ocean and try to spot whales. The (laughs) country, not the giant swimming mammals. Another convo with the older brother is next, after which Connor immediately finds a hat and shades for the next day at school. We then cut through some more marital troubles at the house, some sibling Hall and Oates dance bonding, and we cut to the Sing Street Boys doing another video for another amazing song that plays over them all failing at their midterms. Next up is a boat ride with Cosmo and Rafina out to an island to discuss song ideas and life and how much biscuit is too much to have in your mouth during a kiss. 
Then mm -hmm. it's time for yet another family meeting, this time about the split up and who will or won't be staying at Tony's. Then it's time for Jack Rayner to almost steal the movie as he lays out for his younger brother how his jet engine self was the one that cut a path for him to even be mm -hmm. here. Cut to the Back to the Future American Prom inspired video recording for a song still stuck in my head eight years later, Drive It Like You Stole It. This mm -hmm. time though, we get a fantasy number with everyone playing a role, but reality doesn't quite live up to the fantasy as Rafina has gone to London with the jerk face. Connor does eventually find her and discovers that the London trip was terrible. After she calls him a 15-year-old schoolboy, he doesn't want to talk to her anymore, and he leaves the park through a pack of doves that John Woo must have left there. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. time to write another song and prep for a gig by hiring Bully Barry to be their roadie. The gig goes well, and all the complicated boys and girls seem to be enjoying themselves until they decide to do a slow song. But it's okay, because the movie will use it to montage Connor's feelings for Rafina and her finding her way back to him by listening to the song in her room. They finish the set with Brown Shoes, which is an absolute takedown of Brother Baxter that includes cutouts of his face for everyone in the crowd to wear. So after burning down any chance he had of attending that school anymore, Connor gets his brother to take him and Rafina to their boat to go to England with a pocket full of demo tapes, pictures, and apparently no sterling. As Connor's brother celebrates back on land, Connor and Rafina start to navigate the foggy, uncertain future. And after almost running into a ferry and killing them both, uh, they follow that ferry to what will certainly be an adventure, if nothing else. And that is Sing Street. What did you guys mm -hmm. think about Sing was Street? It a, was it a ferry? I think so. I thought it was just a big ship. I kept thinking... <laughs> When they turned to follow it, I was like, what if it's not going to England, man? What if it's going to America? You guys are screwed. They set mm, it up yeah. earlier, I think, in the movie. They mentioned that ferry. No, that's right. And all they're, the people all, going on it. and Yeah, yeah. all the people are Irish going to England yes. on that yeah. boat, yes. All right. <clears throat> Fair enough. Um, all right. I love this movie. I watched it in theaters back in the day. I had not seen it until now. Um, uh, just some passing uh notes on this movie uh i love aiden gillen at the beginning of this movie who's explaining to the kids what's going on and connor is like it's like am i being taken out of school completely and he's like no you're being taken from one school to another school and then <laughs> and then and then his brother brendan makes a sick joke about the new school's latin motto and he, you know, it's like, does the, like, does we rape students here or something like that? And he's like, no, it doesn't, Brendan. It means act manly. <laughs> I love that. I love how he's so matter of fact about yeah, everything yeah. in this. Uh, he is clearly uh, switched off, by the way, in that marriage and everything. He knows that he's at a turning point in his life and he's kind of, he's a sad character, but you can see hope for him kind of by the end of it, I guess, even though he's sleeping on a cot next to the bed by the end of it. Um, but it feels like he's someone who has resigned himself to where he is. And, and I think it feels like, I don't know why it felt hopeful to me. And it's maybe because of John Carney himself, because mm -hmm. everything he does in this keeps the conflict at, you know, at bay. It's never really outwardly there. Um, uh, I, uh, I love how Connor takes Brendan's words to heart in many point parts of this movie, including of course, like going through that whole thing about Duran Duran and John Taylor and all that stuff later on that impresses Eamon enough to, uh, lend him the instruments and everything. Um, uh, but you know, and then Brendan has that, that one line in there where he's like what tyranny could stand up to that when he's talking about music videos <laughs> and that's sort of where that sort of driver for connor in this movie is that he's wanting to make music and music videos not only he's standing up to tyranny he's got bullies and he's got the you know brother baxter and of course he wants to get the girl that's the main thing he wants to get the girl um i love connor's confidence and self-respect throughout yes that's one of the things that I think other movies like the cliche movie is that, Oh, he doesn't know how to do things yet. So he's going to be awkward and be very shy and all this. He's not shy. He can be bullied, but he's, he's very confident all the way through. And I love the scene too. It's uh, later on where, where it would be easy for him while, sh while uh, Rafina is putting him down essentially to just stay there and be like, but, 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 but you like me, right? You like me. And he's just like, 
he's like, I'm going to go off and go to my band. And she's like, can, well, I'd like to hear about it. And he's like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to tell you about it. Um, there's a, a very brief shot I thought was really funny of Eamon's mom taking time to get her vibrator ready. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. They're sitting there playing Rio by Duran Duran downstairs. And she's just like, I'm putting batteries in my foot. <laughs> she closes the door with her foot. Um, Brendan, once again, you, you mentioned him stealing the movie. I think he does, by the way. Um, uh, he has that great line where he says, you don't need to learn how to play. You need to learn how not to play. Mm. Um, I love that line. Um uh, I love how awkward and clumsy that first video is. They're knocking shit over. Um, they they keep moving stuff around, and you know they're not they're not quite confident in how they're doing it, but they're learning. That's the point. And I love I love that. I love how very eighties VHS it is. <laughs> um, the uh, <laughs> there there's the line. What was he listening to? He's talking about Rafina's boyfriend or whatever, and he's like, "What was he listening to?" Was Genesis. He's like, "Oh, he won't be a problem." <laughs> and it was like, no woman can truly be with a man who listens to Phil Collins. Now, I don't know if that's just a cheap shot at Phil Collins. Uh, I love, I love Phil Collins and Genesis, and and maybe, maybe to the point that they haven't listened to the Invisible Touch album yet. That's the reason why Brendan's down on them, but. Uh, I get it. I get it. He's milk toast, whatever, but he's come up with a lot of great songs. God damn it. But it's a great line. It's a great line. Anyway, um, I could have used a lot more Connor and Eamon talking about and making songs together. I could have, I could have used another 10 to 15 minutes of that. I think Amen. it's great. What's that? Amen. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> There's a great, there are some great scenes of them just together listening to albums and talking about music that I think is great. And the movie could have, I mean, I would have sat there for another 10 minutes watching, listening to them talk about it. Um, I, I love Rafina jumping into the water when she can't swim. It's for our art Cosmo. It's for our art. Um, sh speaking of John Carney puts all the conflict at arm's length that can be a positive and that can be a negative rafina low-key says she was sexually abused in this movie and it just kind of that's it that's all they she doesn't even come out and say it she just kind of says this is what happened and my 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 mom's more attractive than me so i don't know why my dad would get, want me or something like that and that's the end of it and there's a lot of just like very low key things in there. Like, I don't know if we should be like embrace the subtlety of that type of comment or be like, Oh, it's kind of, Oh, that's kind of sickening, but he doesn't, I know why he doesn't go there. And it's because it's just going to bring down the positiveness of his movie. And he wants to have the conflict bubbling at the surface. I get it. But that's one of those. That's a weird, it was a weird way to put it. Um, I feel like not to interrupt your flow, but I, mm -hmm. I, I strongly agree with what you're saying here. Um, it, it was a little hard for me to see both, both that and the, and the priest casually saying, you have a pretty face come into my bathroom. Yeah. Felt like they belonged in a different movie. Um, yes. and I feel like the, the principal priest was, was bully enough with the shoes. Mm -hmm. Um, and the girl's story was sad enough when he walks by and realizes that's not her family's house. That's a home for girls right. and realizes she doesn't have parents. I don't know that either one of those extreme moments needed to be there. I'll let you continue. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's another one that you brought up there was the, was the brother Baxter thing. There's, there's very low key, like sexual abuse things going on there too, that he kind of, well, he le it's almost Shawshank Redemption esque in a way, uh, yeah. the way that that scene plays out. Um, so it's it's it, it was very strange. Um, I love Connor's smile after the kiss on the island. I thought that was fun. Like they they had the double kiss basically, and then they they cut straight to him on the boat uh, with this this like ah, I can't believe that happened look <laughs> on his face. Um, I love how, and this is, uh, Aaron brought this up. I love how Brendan officially cracks after the parents announced the separation. Um, I was trying to read some things into that scene um, because he's been very cool up to this point. Mm -hmm. He's been keeping all of his anger down. 
And we, we, we've heard a story before this that he was going to go to Germany and then his mom brought him back or, or prevented him from doing it. And, um, and you get the sense that it's not, it, the parents divorce is one wedge into him finally getting to this point, but then him realizing where, where he could have been. And that the fact that I got the sense that because he was stopped from going to Germany because they wanted to keep the family together and whatever, and now the family's coming apart and now he's still here. That is what really ultimately broke him. And he was talking about like, I used to be a jet engine and all this other stuff. Um, and I thought that was a really, I mean, that's such a great scene. I mean, uh, just that, that was probably what stole the show for me, even though there's a lot of great things in this. Um, I love Connor's idealized music video in his head when he's doing that uh, drive it like you stole it. Um, mm. uh, he sees a place for everybody in that video. Everything is positive. This is before he's officially been disillusioned. Uh, it's probably a breaking point of his disillusionment uh, at this point because uh, Rafina doesn't show up and then she comes back and she's, she's, uh, she's talking a bunch of stuff that she, he thinks is stupid basically. Um, and he even has a, he has a place for the terrible schoolmaster in this. The, he's, he's positive for everybody. And then I think that's the official end of, of him being disillusioned about everything. And I think also not only is he upset about, uh, the fact that she calls him uh, hanging out with a 15 year old schoolboy, but there's a lot leading up to that too. She says a lot of things <clears throat> that's like, she's very down on herself the whole time. And he's already like, man, fuck you already. <laughs> and then she says, hanging out with a 15 year old schoolboy, And I'm just like my mom and all that. That's, that was the breaking point for sure. Uh, but, uh, but that was uh, a, a thing that I got out of that. So um, yeah, this movie's great. There's a lot of things you can pick on uh, for it. Uh, that's got just, it's just very good stuff. So uh, anyway. I think the movie is way too charming um, and hopeful uh, to come away with anything but a smile when you're watching it. Um, mm -hmm. The child actors, child actors, young preteen, I don't know how old they are. Um, they're all great. I especially loved the, the kid that played the producer, the redhead kid. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I looked him up to see where he went in life and he's still doing some acting, but it seems like it's mostly stuff in ireland and england and stuff that doesn't make its way over here or that i just haven't come across um i was really stuck by the kid that struck by the kid that played connor the lead mm -hmm. uh and for a good 20 minutes i had a strong debate about whether or not he was young nicholas holt uh, the timing doesn't line up but <laughs> he could play younger nicholas holt uh so easily um he's really really engaging i liked what you said chris about his confidence uh i i use different words in explaining to my wife why I liked this kid. But I, I said, he walks up to this girl, this pretty girl, the, the second he sees her, he's told no one approaches this girl and he walks right up to her. He is, he is not shy. He's not afraid, but he is also still unsure how to look cool. So like mm -hmm. when he tells her the name of the song is the riddle of the model. She's like, Oh, that's sweet. And he's like, Oh, it's, it's not about you. It's about another model that I know. <laughs> and, and if he was just a little more savvy, he would have known, lean into that. If she thinks that's sweet, lean into that, buddy. Um, mm -hmm. I I ultimately think I stopped just short of loving it um, because of that stuff I talked about earlier, that the heavier mm -hmm. stuff thrown in that just almost took me out. Uh, and then there are, that allowed my brain to start <laughs> overanalyzing some of the writing songs and being in a band stuff because mm. I think it's very obvious that the person that made this movie has been in a band uh, and has written songs. That's clear, not just from what he shows in those processes, but the, the loving way that he shoots that process. You mentioned the scenes of those two kids writing songs together. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that almost pulled me to love. I have a very good friend that was in the band with me that I was in, and we would go off to the park with our guitars and write songs together. And I remember those moments very fondly. Um, I will say songs do not come together 
this quickly <laughs> for a movie that is showing you the songwriting process almost as real as it can be shown it sure as hell speeds it up now it has to because it would be boring if you saw 30 minutes of them spending a week and a half getting this song right that's not fun um and it's more fun that they just finish the song in one afternoon and the next time you see them the whole band has learned it and they all know their parts perfectly and they're all great musicians there's even a bit yeah. I wrote down about connor in the beginning they ask if connor plays a instrument and he says i'm more of a singer really and then later on he's just picking and strumming on a guitar like he's eric mm. clapton or something like i was when did he learn how to play it? the movie <laughs> including a police-esque guitar riff at the beginning of one of those songs yeah. that was like wow amazing <laughs> i uh i really actually appreciate the the love and the care that went into uh showing the, the songwriting process and the camaraderie of being in a band and you don't even have to be a good or successful band um, for that experience to mean something. Uh, and, and I carry those memories. It was 25 years ago now, um, you know, to this day, uh, I want to go through some notes. Almost all of them are going to be positive. The first one happens to be a question. How is a Catholic school a cheaper option than wherever they were sending him before? It's my, I realize we're in <laughs> Ireland and maybe everything's Catholic. So even public schools are Catholic. But I was like, growing up, I understood Catholic schools to be much more expensive. Anyway, um, I wrote down a lot of lines that I love. Dialogue. I think this movie is peppered with some really great dialogue. There's a scene where the guy that plays all the instruments and happens to keep a bunch of rabbits is scolding one of his rabbits for always shitting on his bed. And I think mm. it's Connor says, you can't put rabbits on your bed and not expect them to shit on it. And I yeah. just thought, man, that is like... Yogi Berra esque life advice. Like you could, anyway, I thought that was really funny. Um, <clears throat> he sings uh, Take On Me um, to the girl when she asks him to sing to prove that he's going to be in a band. He only knows those, those, li those three words. Um, but then later on in the movie, uh, after the priest roughs him up in the bathroom, when he's walking with the girl, there's like a slow piano version of Take On Me that yeah. plays underneath that. And it's just another illustration of how much the filmmaker understands music. And of course, almost all of his films incorporate music as a plot element. Um, but it's just, just, there were several moments like that in here. Um, <clears throat> I love the line when the girl says, my mom's in and out of the hospital. And he says, oh, why? Oh, she's a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Before giving the real reason. Um, <clears throat> I love how the band shamelessly steals the, 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 the fashion style of every band they mimic in each song they write. So every time mm -hmm. they come to school in a new look, uh, like especially when they come around the corner dressed as the cure. <laughs> And now we're in our happy, sad era. Um, yeah. um, <clears throat> the second song the band writes, I don't remember the name of it, but it also comes back later in the film as a slower, sad kind of underscore. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Okay, I already said that. Um, I don't know how they got the gig at the dance. I feel like the movie went from, let's see if we can get that gig, to they just had the gig, um, mm. which, again, it probably it's not a movie that cares too much about that but for a principal being one of your main antagonists i felt like there was going to be some kind of thing they had to do to win that right yeah um, and they didn't they just that that is a, a one of the weird plot flaws i guess of this movie is that this uh brother baxter is such a hard ass about them wearing makeup and all this other stuff but oh you can play at our our function that's totally fine that he, he seems actually pretty cool about that in fact he does. he does um there's a there's one of the teachers there is on their side and i think she's the one that was in charge of picking that i think they kind of I show see. a couple scenes of her being supportive of them. And then, by the way, like, well, did you get the vibe that the teacher was kind of into him uh, when she sat down? Next I think there's to him a little, I think there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of like that, um, you know, enamored kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to know what you guys think about the brother not showing up to play a solo after they had that whole scene about, Hey, I want you to come play a solo. And he's like, I'll be there. And then he just, that plot just goes nowhere. They don't even mm. ever talk about it again. Um, yeah. Because I was expecting, when the girl didn't show up at the dance, I was expecting the brother to show up and save the day and rip an awesome solo and further bond those guys together. And it just, that thread just f fell apart. Um, mm. 
those are all my notes. I really, really liked it. I think it's so charming. Uh, and I think if you don't get the right actors for all these kids uh, in the band, uh, then it's not going to work. Uh, they really mm -hmm. struck gold with some of these. <clears throat> yeah. I think the movie is specifically, and it, it ends this way uh, with the line, you know, this is for brothers everywhere or something like that. I forget exactly what it says on the screen, but at the end, uh, you know, it mentions brothers. And I think that mm -hmm. the, the, really the, the heart of this movie is that relationship between uh, him and his brother. And I think it ties in with the other thing you were talking about, Chris, of his confidence and self-independence. Like he mm -hmm. has this thing where he he likes community. He likes writing songs together. He likes learning from his brother, having conversations with his brother. He likes this girl and wants to spend time with her, but he doesn't need them. He's not codependent with them. And so mm -hmm. for the, the, uh, the key moment of the movie, to be where both the girl and the brother let him down, he's good because it's never mm -hmm. been really about that. It's mm -hmm. about him. Like even from the very beginning, like in, and you mentioned a couple instances, uh, but even the, like the very first bullying moment where he's pulled in the bathroom and the kid takes the slingshot out, he does do a little jig. And then the kid's like, all right, now you're going to go in that bathroom. He's like, no, I'm not. And he just walks mm -hmm. out in the movie. Yep. The movie is full. He does that later with brother Baxter that we've talked about. Does the exact same thing. Nope, not doing mm. that. And, and yeah. walks out. And there's this real self-assuredness and independence of thought that I think the movie is tying into his growth with music and writing music and how that impacts his he ability to see the world. He even says there's another moment later in the movie where the, they're walking to school and the bully calls him out in front of everyone. And he says, he basically calls the bully out and says, you can only destroy, you mm. cannot create. And he's mm. embraced the fact that creating art like is, is empowering. Um, right. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but, that's uh, that's exactly what I think the, the movie is saying. And so when, when we see uh, his brother just absolutely giddy at the end on shore that they've made it, that's because he is living vicariously through his younger brother. He doesn't have that, didn't have that same self-assuredness, that same independence, that same ability to walk away when it would have been his time to walk away. And he's so happy to see that his brother's actually doing it. And and so, yeah, so it becomes this movie about uh, an older brother living vicariously through a younger brother who is finding their independent voice uh, through music. Even and though those two kids are fucked, right? Like, we can all agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's not yeah. coming back with a record deal. <laughs> <That's> um, <right. laughs> yeah. Yeah, that ain't happening. No, the, the pictures aren't going to go the right way. <laughs> and, the, uh, and the going into a, a going into like a label with your demo tapes from Ireland, you're not going to be getting I... past the desk. I loved that moment. Um, the, the brother cheering on the shore. I wanted to talk about it specifically because yeah. there's this competition Aaron and I were both in in college uh, where it's like a mock Miss America thing with men. Um, and um, <clears throat> Aaron and I were both freshmen. Uh, and there were 10, I think, overall people. My brother was a senior, and he was also one of the 10. And you do like a little question and answer, then you do like a talent show, and then... Um, I forget, I did like a stand up comedy bit. Um, anyway, um, I placed third. Mm -hmm. And when they announced that, my brother, who was already on stage or backstage, let out a cheer. Uh, I'm getting chills thinking about it right now. This is maybe the first time in my entire life that I realized he's happy for me. Mm -hmm. He's not. This has nothing to do with him. He's just yeah. expressing his happiness and love for me. And so that move moment on the end at the movie, um, when he's cheering for them, that's what he's doing. He's happy. You said it. He's happy for his brother, but he's also he, that joy is real. Mm -hmm. It's not all vicarious. He's it's real. I almost picked Goodwill Hunting as my <laughs> double feature just because of that moment because it reminded mm -hmm. me of that Ben Affleck smile at the end when he realizes Matt Damon has gone on to live his best life. Um, yep. really, really good moment. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, let's go on to our super secret double feature. Hmm. Hmm. You want to go first? What do you, you want me to go first? What do you think, Jeremy? Well, I'm, I've got, um, uh, I've got something incredibly obscure for you, um, that I haven't even seen since 1999 when I watched it on VHS mm. with my roommates. Um, and I thought of a lot of films. I don't want to say any of them in case... They are ones you chose because this movie gave me a lot of feels in different directions. Uh, but mm -hmm. I ultimately settled 
on wanting to, to double feature a film that captures the magic and family of starting a band. Um, and so I'm going with uh, an indie film called Bandwagon from 1996. Mm. Um, the only name in here that you're probably going to recognize is Kevin Corrigan. He yeah. played the cousin in The Departed that gets Leo into the crime business. Mm -hmm. um, this is about a guy who loses his job and decides to start a band. They, he starts a band with strangers. None of them know each other. They go on the road in a van. The lead singer is so nervous. He faces the back wall instead of the audience every time <laughs> they perform. Um, and it's a much more of a dramedy, comedy, road trip kind of film than Sing Street, which is more coming of age. But I think um, they would complement each other really well in terms of um, that whole like that family thing that aspect of being part of a band and that um <clears throat> power that comes from creating art uh you can actually mm -hmm. watch bandwagon in its entirety on youtube um if you are mm. so inclined you can also watch the trailer and see if it moves mm. you at all um but i watched this with my buddy josh who we talk about a lot uh and we both really really liked it and i have never seen it or talked about it since but this movie brought it back into my mind <clears throat> huh never have heard of this before okay okay um, I had two circling in my head and I think I changed, I was, I was definitely going to go with one and then end up thinking about the second one a little bit more and deciding to go with Rushmore as my, uh, my double feature for this. Uh, there is a, I mean, there's a direct correlation with the, you know, making friends with the bully at the end and getting them to do your thing. I didn't know if there was very, there were many other connections because Rushmore is such a, it's a dark comedy. It's, it's a, it's a love triangle movie basically with Bill Murray and Jason Schwartzman going after Olivia Williams, but everything Jason Schwartzman does in that movie is about getting Olivia Williams. That's the thing. Everything he does mm. in that movie is that either the, the, you know, getting Latin, getting Latin back into the school, putting on this huge play at the end, uh, you know, everything is about that. So, uh, I, and of course he, he's, he's in one school, uh, he's in, he's in Rushmore and then he has, you know, he's kicked out and he has to go to a trashy public school, uh, and everything, but he still kind of lives at Rushmore throughout the whole thing. But, uh, the other movie that I thought of during this, that was, I was like almost definitely going to say it was be kind rewind. Oh, wow. Um, there was another one where you have people who are going out and making things and like, you know, trying to save their video store and all this, uh, stuff. And I, I, I haven't seen be kind rewind in so long. I, you know, I don't know. I can't really talk, uh, uh smartly about it. I don't think, but, uh, but I remember it being at least sweet and like a sweet movie, like this movie is, um, for sure. And, uh, and, and, and about the power of family and creating things to get. Absolutely. I think that's an yeah. awesome pick. Yeah. I had, I wanted well, to mention that the older brother almost on his own made me pick almost famous the way he passionately yep. talked and instructed about rock and roll and oh, yes. music and art. Um, and, uh, and even uh, there's a lot of parallels in almost famous, but, um, I still like the pick that I made. Yeah. Brendan is definitely the Lester bangs in this, uh, yeah. in this one. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. On to, uh, what our homework is for next week. Jeremy, what are we watching for next week? Let's get sexy. Um, I have chosen, uh, <laughs> John McTiernan's the Thomas crown affair. Oh my. Um, with Pierce Brosnan and Rene Russo and Dennis Leary. Um, and, uh, this is like a 68 on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know what the hell's wrong. Man, this movie's great. I, uh, you may not you adore know. it. It's what? a movie that's a remake of a Steve McQueen movie that people hold dear in their yeah, hearts. Yeah, I suppose. But if they good. were able to watch it without that in their hearts, they would realize this movie's pretty good, too. Yep. So, <laughs> um, um, This is on Max right now, um, and it looks like that's about it. If you have a premium subscription at any of the places that roll in Max, um, then you can watch it there as well. Um, warning to those who tend to watch some of these movies with children. There is nudity aplenty in this movie. Uh, and uh, I just want you to know that before you show your children. This movie. Maybe your kids are into that. Um, 
<laughs> Maybe I'll have Jonathan cut that part. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I saw part of this the other day. Hadn't seen it in five years, and I didn't finish it. I was like, yep, that's going on the list. We're going to do this one on the show. Uh, I want to dive into it. And um, so, yeah, I think we have time for a question or two. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Yep. All right. Let's see what we got. I only sent you guys 30 questions this week. <laughs> True. Um, what movie, what movie moment will always make you cry? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was assuming that we cry at movies, but okay. <clears throat> I mean, there's probably a few others that I would say other than this, but, um, I always thought it was just, I mean, it's just super sad after Mufasa dies in the Lion King and <laughs> Simba goes over there and nudges him. I think the nudge is what gets me the most yeah. out of that whole scene. Um, because you can really see, and especially the way they animated it, you know, he, Mufasa is clearly dead, right? You can't say otherwise at that point. Um, and then although this scene has been fucked by Saturday night live, the dead poet society, Oh, captain, my captain scene Mm. at the end, when they stand on the desks, of course, Saturday night live (laughs) made a skit where they're all getting their heads decapitated by ceiling fans, but it's awesome. awesome. Yes, it is. But the scene itself in dead poet society (laughs) is awesome. And I want everybody to fucking acknowledge that anyway, Aaron, uh i have a couple um sam wise going after frodo at the end of fellowship just uh it's it's immediate tears he's like Mm -hmm. you know i'm going and frodo's like of course you are but i'm coming with you and he just will not you know leave him to do this alone and there's something about community and friendship and the idea of being there for someone that just really gets into my heart and so every time Mm -hmm. i see that uh i cry uh, finding Nemo, the reunion and finding Nemo gets me every time. Uh, mm. that's probably just as, uh, you know, a dad who has four sons and, you know, just th- that idea of something you thought was lost being refound. Mm. Uh, and then one that will feel silly to most, but it's true. I cry every time at the end of swing kids. Uh, <laughs> there, there is a moment where at the very end where, uh, their cry to each other as, you know, these people who are fighting against the Nazi youth program and that kind of thing is swing Heil uh instead of heil hitler they say swing heil and um he has uh is being taken away uh by the nazis and there's this moment where his little brother speaking of brothers picks up his umbrella and you know says swing heil like i'm i'm you know this means something to me i'm going to follow in your footsteps and it just it brings me to tears every single time mm. so yep. mm. Mm. it's not a movie but in hamilton Every time the kid dies and those piano notes start, that song wrecks me. And I mm-hmm. I cry almost, well, even thinking about it sometimes. Um, and then the end of About Time, if you've seen it, um, you've probably heard me talk about it before, but if you've seen it, he goes off at the end to run on the beach with his dad as a little kid and spend some time in that memory and it just... Oh, that, 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 uh, that Hamilton thing is, is set up so well too. you know, like the, the first time we see that kid, he's learning how to count to 10, of course, which comes later on and, yep. and, uh, they keep incorporating that set to eat enough and all that stuff in it. And it's like, man, it's so well done. It's so fucking yep. well done. <laughs> um, over in the comments, uh, we have up. Yes. That beginning mm. of up is, is devastating. Yep. Uh, shaggy nuts also says onward since my dad died. Yeah, that would, that would definitely be a big one. Josh with the jokey one, uncle got salt in my eye from popcorn at the theater during lethal weapon two. Does that count? Sure. <laughs> why not? Um, shaggy also says about time. Yes. About time. Definitely has some, some moments in that, um, uh, the, uh, James says the moment in the modern day epilogue of Schindler's list where one of the survivors gently rubs Oscar's grave. Yes. Um, uh, not a movie, but scrubs. Where do you think we are? The end of the Brendan Fraser arc. Oh my God. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. If you're familiar with scrubs, you know what you're, what that's all about. Um, I had a friend who rewatched Armageddon frequently and cried every time. I guess, you know, Bruce Willis at the end. That's okay. Yeah, I can see it. If, if you're, if you're really into that movie, Daddy. um, 
<laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Alan says ET always gets me. Uh, Shaggy also says my girl. My girl definitely has uh, some very a, a very sad moment in there. And then uh, Polly says Grave of the Fireflies definitely has some sad moments in that mm-hmm. movie. Um and um yeah yeah guys all right I think that's a show um show. <clears throat> yeah next week uh, is Thomas Crown Affair from 1999 remember that because the, you will be you will encounter another version of that movie mm-hmm. as well. mm-hmm. Faye Dunaway's in both of them oh oh there you go um but uh, that will uh, do it for this week we will see you next time see ya bye, bye guys. everybody. Bye.